Our reading of the scriptures comes from John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We start to read at verse 14. John 6, beginning at verse 14. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 men plus women and children. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was now not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about twenty-five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship. And they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I. Be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, Albeit there came other, ship, other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat man in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then said, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, 
and I will raise him up at the last day. We stop in our reading of the word of God at that point. May he bless it. Verse 37, John 6, verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Tonight we use this passage of scripture as part of the biblical foundation for our consideration of the fifth of the five points of Calvinism. The Canons of Dort treat them in the order of first unconditional election, then limited atonement, and then together total depravity and irresistible grace. And then finally, the perseverance of the saints. We might often want to call it the preservation of the saints. And in wording it that way, make it a work of God emphatically. But our fathers were told in answering the charge of the remonstrance of the Arminians, instead phrase called it the perseverance of the saints. The charge was, you make it all God's work, and man does nothing. And in response to that charge, our fathers deliberately entitled the fifth head, the perseverance of the saints. The instruction of God's word that that brings to us is that the Reformation and we as children of the Reformation stand firm on the biblical position that believers in Christ will certainly be preserved or will certainly persevere unto the end, and will never fall from grace. A very common and easy way to understand that is to say it this way. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. But it might be good to add this. And what you do is the proof of your salvation. Once saved, always saved, and what you do is the proof of that salvation. We consider this passage of the Word of God, and we take as our theme preservation and perseverance. We look first of all at that work of God that is called the preservation of the saints. It's been understood this way, to be that work of God's grace whereby he preserves believers and saints in Christ Jesus in the power and in his power and through faith unto the very end of salvation and glory, so that they fight the good fight of faith and never fall away from the grace that they once received. A work of God's grace. A work of God's grace in those that he has already Elected, regenerated, called, justified, and is sanctifying. Making them believers. Making them saints in Christ Jesus. That work of his grace whereby by his power and through the faith that he has given to them, he enables them to continue in that unto salvation and glory. 
But in the way of, they're exercising that faith. They're fighting the good fight of faith until they reach that end of glory from which they cannot fall away. Salvation from beginning to the end is a work of God. And it's a work of God's grace. We don't earn it by our works. We can't lose it by our sins. But that work of God's grace that begins salvation, we used it in the text for Matthew's Confession of Faith, he will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. And of that we are confident. But that work of God's grace does not deny man's responsibility. Because God never forsakes his work, it's evident that the saints will persevere unto the very end. What our text does is shows that the root of the preservation of the saints is election. Jesus phrases it this way, The ones that the Father giveth to me, the ones the Father, all that the Father giveth to me, in his sacerdotal prayer in John 17, that's the only way he referred to the rest of the church and to the other members of his body. They are the ones that the Father has given to me. He has gifted me with them. The text makes it clear that the Father doesn't give them to him because they come to Jesus but the other way around. They come to Jesus because the Father gave them to Jesus. When did the Father give them to Jesus? Even the young people and the children know this. Ephesians 1 verse 4, from before the foundation of the world, in eternity past, God, as a living reality of his mind, gave all of those that he would had chosen unto eternal life, in the very choosing of them, he chose them in Christ. And that's the activity of his giving them to him. They become his own. They become his people. His own, his people, gifted to him. Got the words? Now listen to the angel to Joseph. Your wife is pregnant. She's with child by the Holy Spirit. And you have to call his name Jesus, Savior, for he shall save his people, the ones that the Father gave to him. He shall save his people from their sins. Notice and don't let it alter your thinking about the work of God in eternity in that Jesus phrases it as a present tense. He doesn't say all that the Father gave to me, but all that the Father giveth to me. And the present tense is used very deliberately because when God doesn't work, he doesn't do it, and then he's finished with it, and he sets it aside, and he goes on to another work. The very nature of God is that that work never stops. Just as the Word of God that would create and bring into existence a bookmark or anything else, the amazing nature of God's creating it and sustaining it is that the word that he spoke to bring it into existence, he continues. He continues. Even to sustain the ashes or the dust that it might become. 
That's God's work. So He gave us in eternity past, but that's not done or completed in the sense, in that sense that we would complete a work. He continues the process of giving that. It's an ongoing act. Whom did He give? Well, all that the Father giveth me shall come. But listen to what Jesus said just before that. That ye also have seen me and believe not. I said that to you, he says. That you believe not. A little later in this chapter, a part that we didn't read, he says the same thing. There are those that don't come to him. In chapter 10, he says, there are those who are not my sheep. So when he says, you believe not, all that the Father giveth to me, do believe. Do come to me. And he sets up the contrast between those that believe not and those that do come to him or believe in him. And by doing that, Jesus makes it very clear God did not give everyone head for head to Jesus. And then suddenly, that makes, aware, makes us aware that there was a definite, particular number that were given to Jesus. And that makes the wonder the miracle that not all but some are even more amazing why why me why was i one of those that the father gave to jesus the giving of us is to Jesus. So go again to Matthew 1. He gave us to Jesus. He gave us to the Savior. In giving us to the Savior, He performed the work that was necessary. He saved us. Jesus said, verse 35, that name means Savior. And that identifies the work that and the purpose of the gift to Jesus. What a gift. Here. Save them. Bear the burden of their sin. Suffer their hells. Endure all their iniquities. But I gift them to you for you to do that work of saving them. And now read the next verse. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of those which he hath given me, I would lose nothing. Nothing. And he re explains but should raise it up at the last day. Bring it to the resurrection of life at the last day. I will lose none of those given. I will save them. When we ask, why me? Then the answer to that is given to us in part in Romans 11, verses 5 and 6. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to, listen carefully, the election of grace. That choosing, that giving us to Jesus. Why? 
Well, it was because of the boundless nature of our sin that we realized no one deserved to be given. And if we were chosen and to be given to Jesus, it was of grace. Of grace. And then he explains, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. You get it? So he says it again a different way. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans 11, 5 and 6. It's an election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. God did not give us to Jesus because we come to him. But we come to him because he gave us to Jesus. The only reason for the choice is in God. He graciously willed it. Willed to do it. Let's reinforce that with 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Again, that's a good one to underline. He saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, election of grace, which is given in Christ Jesus before the world began. Our preservation is rooted in election, in God giving us to Jesus. The word election all by itself may, may make us think of some doctrine. But if you call election the giving of a certain number of sinners to Jesus to be saved, all of a sudden that word takes on a beautiful flavor. We were given to Jesus to all those given to Jesus come to him. Come to him. A few weeks ago, when we treated the fourth head of the five points, namely irresistible grace, we used verse 44 of this chapter. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We come. Election, the giving of us to Christ, determines the end, where we're going. Salvation, glory, the resurrection at the last day. But it doesn't just determine the destination where we're going, it also determines the way to that end. And the way to that end is called, they come to me. They come to me. That's a figure of speech, of course, describing an activity. It's an activity of faith. Herman Hoeksema, in the definition of preservation that I gave before, called that activity of faith fighting the good fight of faith. It is the activity of faith, which is believing. Believing. It's the activity of holding him to be God's only begotten son. It's the activity of receiving that gift, the privilege 
actively and consciously rejoicing in the knowledge. I'm one of those particular ones that the Father chose in Christ and gave to Jesus. I'm one of those particular ones that Jesus worked the work of salvation in and upon me. I believe. I receive salvation. I find forgiveness and deliverance. <clears throat> then that amazing expression is used not only in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. But it's even used, and we've highlighted this before not so long ago, in Mark 10, when Jesus said to the disciples, When those parents want to bring their infants to me to be baptized, to be touched, to be blessed, then those children are coming to me. And you must not forbid them. And then he explains further, coming to Jesus is an activity of walking in the kingdom. Of such is the kingdom of God. And except you become as one of these, you cannot enter into the kingdom coming is the ex coming to Jesus is the expression of believing of holding him to be God's son of finding in him salvation forgiveness righteousness of knowing by the grace of God I'm saved coming to Jesus all that the Father giveth to me, cometh to me. We believe in the perseverance or preservation of the saints, of the saints. That is different than saying we believe in the preservation of all of those who profess to be a Christian. Not all professors are identified as saints or as believers or come to Jesus to be saved. Think of Matthew 7. Jesus said there are some who say, Lord, Lord, I did this and I did that. I ought to be received on the basis of what I have done. And he says, I never knew you. So not all who profess to be Christians, but rather the identification of all those who are given to the Father, given by the Father to Jesus, are what we would call saints, believers, those given to Christ, and with that giving to Christ, being given true, living faith in Jesus. Those who are gifted to Jesus persevere, become active, They're not moved about, as the canons say, as stocks and blocks. As man, by the fall, did not cease to be a creature endowed with understanding and will. By the fall, he didn't stop being, having a mind and a will. Nor did sin, which pervaded the whole race, of the, deprive him of a human nature. He's still human. He's not a tree. He's not a thing. He's not a chair, a book, or a dog. He's a human with a mind and with a will. The fall into sin did not deprive him of that, but brought upon him depravity and spiritual nature. So also the grace of regeneration does not treat man as a senseless stock and block. 
nor take away their will and its properties, nor does violence to that will or that mind, but spiritually quickens, heals, corrects, and at the same time sweetly and powerfully bends it that where there was carnal rebellion and resistance, formerly, now there's a ready and sincere spiritual obedience begins to reign in which the true and spiritual restoration and freedom of our will consist. We're rational moral creatures. The grace of preservation implies coming, implies perseverance. That is why the grace of election, sovereign election, and sovereign grace, salvation, does not make the saved ones careless profane. I'm saved. I'm locked in. God's going to preserve me. I can live any way I want. That's careless and profane. Two expressions. The preservation of the saints is the cause of the perseverance of the saints. The preservation of the saints is the cause of the perseverance of the saints. The grace of preservation is manifested in and through the saints as they persevere. The grace of preservation is manifested, evidenced, in and through the saints as they're persevering or as they persevere. You can and say it this way. The certainty of, of our perseverance serves as an incentive to serious and constant practice of gratitude and good works. Canons 5.12. And then it adds, and that confidence renders them the more careful to continue in the ways of God. And our walking in those ways maintains an assurance of our persevering. All those given come to me. They come to me. We persevere. And now three. Rooted in election. All those given to him persevere. They come to him. And there's a certainty that every single sinning, yet sinning saint. And remember, you want to know the definition of a saint. Then you go to the fifth head, the first article of the canons. Here's a saint. All those whom God calls according to his purpose into communion with his Son. Regenerates by his Holy Spirit. Delivers from the dominion and slavery of sin. They're given to his Son and in communion with him. They're regenerated and they are delivered from being bondage to sin. From the dominion and, deliver and slavery of sin in this life. Yet not altogether from the body of sin and from the infirmities of the flesh so long as they continue in this world. We are sinning saints given to Christ, coming to Christ always. And though we still sin, this is what he wants us to know. I will in no wise cast you out. I will in no wise, no wise, notice the emphasis, in no wise, not I just will not cast you out, I will in no wise cast them out. God 
wants the saved ones to know, to be assured, just as any parent wants their children to know, you're my child. I love you. And they don't want those children to doubt whether they're their child and loved by him or her. <coughs> him that cometh speaks of everyone who comes, who has been given. And the guarantee of the work of the Holy Spirit is that they will not be cast out. The redeemed in Christ, the renewed by the Spirit, are capped by the power of God. Here's an expression worth remembering. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us, regenerated us, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto a salvation, ready to be revealed. 1 Peter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. An inheritance reserved in heaven for you who are kept by nothing less than the power of God unto a salvation that's ready to be revealed. All of those, all of those, every single one of those, even though they may never be consciously aware of it because they die in the womb, all of those given to Christ redeemed by Him, renewed by His Spirit, may know that they are eternally secure in Him. Eternally secure. The same ones foreknown are predestinated. The same ones predestinated are, just, are called. The same ones called are justified. The same ones justified are glorified. Listen to these familiar words. You know them. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. You're mine. Nothing can separate us ever from that eternal and unchangeable love of God. Isaiah 54, verse 10. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. The Lord hath mercy on thee. We've been predestinated unto eternal glory. And we may be confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen now to the words of Paul as he ends his letter to, his first letter to the Thessalonian church. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth, calleth you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. What's the life that's given to us? 
that life of Christ. It is called eternal life. Eternal life. That's the very nature of the spiritual life of a believer. Of one given to, the, given to Jesus by the Father. He that believes on God's only begotten Son has eternal life. He has it. And he can never perish. John 3.16 The Westminster Confession of Faith says it this way. They whom God has accepted in his beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Starting with the Father giving you to Jesus. Jesus performing an absolutely perfect work of saving all those whom the Father gave to him. He lost not one of them. Millions. As many as the sand and the seashore and the stars. He didn't lose a one. The Father gave them to him. He saved them unto the resurrection of life at the end. You may know that. Even though we look ahead and we're going to see tons of sins and then this morning all kinds of sinfulness. But praise the Lord. It's grace. All grace and only grace. Amen. We thank thee, Father. What else can we say? There's nothing else to be said but thanks and praise to be given to thee for what thou hast done. All honor, glory, be thine. Keep working. And thou wilt. We need not doubt that. Thou dost not work as we do. We stumble. We fail. But thou dost never. Thy grace abideth ever. Amen.